Well, I hope you get your seat belts fastened because uh, we're going to be uh, heading on one tough uh, son of a gun here. We'll be talking about something that's relatively small, but on the other hand is full of so many little nooks and crannies and little odds and ends that'll drive you nuts. And that's going to be the skull. OK, we're going to break it down into a couple smaller uh, PowerPoint videos so that it won't uh, you, you know, you, you won't go outside and, and scream um, or anything like that after a while um, because of the complexity of it. But we're going to start talking today just a little about the anterior cranium and the facial bones and then we're going to be coming up we're going to talk about the rest of the cranium and then we're going to be talking about the cranial base which is one crazy son of a gun okay so we'll talk about that so let's go ahead and get started on talking about the anterior cranium and the facial bones here okay well first of all i think when we look at the cranium we have to divide it into a couple different parts okay one part of the cranium okay is what we actually call the neurocranium the neurocranium and this is the part that really encloses the brain uh, the meninges which are the coverings we'll talk about these later on in the in the nervous system discussions but uh, the membranes that cover the brain are called the meninges um, the proximal part of the cranial nerves okay cranial nerves are are 12 pairs of nerves that actually come directly from the brain they go out through these small little holes in the bottom of the brain which will drive you crazy if you try to learn each and every one of them okay so those are called the cranial nerves they, they actually leave the brain directly and go right to where they're supposed to go as compared to most other nerves in the body, which actually come down from the spinal cord and they actually branch off the spinal cord once they leave, leave the skull. And then inside the neurocranium are a number of blood vessels. OK, and we'll talk more about those when you get to the vascular portion of the course. OK, uh, that's the neurocranium. We also have, and, and we have eight bones that involve this. The frontal bone, which is a singular bone. It's one right in the front. It's only one. OK, we have a paired parietal. That's not parietal. It should be parietal. Leave out that end there. Parietal bone. OK. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, two temporal bones, temporal bones which are on the side, okay, and they're paired, occipital bone in the back posteriorly, uh, one sphenoid and one ethmoid bone, okay? So uh, two of the bones, the parietal bone and the temporal bones are paired, the frontal, the occipital, the sphenoid, and the ethmoid bones are singular, okay? Well, uh, one part of this, of the of the neurocranium is called is called the, the, the calvaria. And the calvaria is the top portion, okay? When they do, um, um, when they do an autopsy and they look at the brain, they basically take a saw and go around the calvaria, pop the whole uh, calvaria, the roof off to be able to get to the brain inside okay and then we have that really crazy thing like I mentioned which is called the cranial base which we'll talk about a little bit later the second portion of the neurocranium that we have okay is called the viscerocranium and the viscerocranium is basically more involving facial bones involving the orbits the nasal cavities the maxilla the mandible and there are a number of bones in here there are 14 bones actually in there uh, two lacrimal bones which are on the inside of the orbits okay two nasal bones which are a little teeny bones which are here at the top of the bone uh, two maxilla the maxilla actually looks like one large bone but it's actually split right in the middle it comes from both sides and it meets and joins in the middle zygomatic bones which are basically the ones that provide a little bit of a, a cheekbone function and also provide to the you know contribute to the orbit um, palatine bones which are basically on the back portion of the roof of the mouth the front portion of the roof of the mouth is actually the maxilla okay the maxilla actually does the front portion of the roof of the hard part of the hard palate in the roof of the mouth but the back portion of the hard palate is basically two palatine bones um, inferior nasal concha which are actually inside the nose uh, inside the nose we have these shelves uh, of mucous membrane that stick out and they're covering over these concha or these bony projections inside the nose uh, we have one mandible which is one jawbone and one vomer vomer actually if you look at the if you if you look at the nose the front portion of the nose is very mobile because that septum or that wall that divides the right side of the nose and left side of the nose is cartilage however after i go back a, per, a certain distance it stops becoming just cartilage it's bone and that bone in the middle that goes all the way to the back of the nose would be called the vomer okay and we'll talk about that in this particular um, powerpoint video so let's look at this anterior cranium to start out with, okay? First of all, we're going to talk about a number of bones here. Okay, let me just get, get my other little drawing uh, tool here. Frontal bones. Basically, this area right here is the frontal bone, this whole area. You can see this. Everything in yellow up here is the frontal bone, okay? The zygomatic bone is right here, and you can see everything in blue is the zygomatic bone. That's called the zygomatic bone, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. That provides a little bit of a cheekbone contour that we get, as well as it provides a little bit of that rim of the orbit, 
right here. That's part of the zygomatic bone. The orbits, we'll talk more about the orbits and the number of bones that make up the orbits. Or actually, there are actually seven orbital bones, okay? Some of them are easy to see, and some of them are more difficult to see. Some of them are big, some of them are very small, okay? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the nasal region. This area right here is called the piriform aperture, okay? It's like a pear-shaped aperture of the nose, okay? And it's called the piriform aperture. We'll talk a little bit about that. The maxilla, the maxilla is this everything in this lilac color right here, that purple, okay? That's basically the upper jaw bone, okay? And also part of the, of the floor of the orbit, right here and the mandible mandible is the jaw you know the lower jaw okay and we're going to talk about each of these individual areas uh specifically okay so then this is just a skull x-ray just showing a little bit about what we see uh, a couple of things i'm going to point out here that might that, that might be um helpful later on uh frontal sinuses if you look here see how this is sort of a, um uh, looks like a like a bunch of leaves they're in here. Basically, um, that's between the inner and outer portion of of the ball, of the skull. Okay, and the skull has, like we talked about, has two tables, you know, which are basically uh, that hard, dense cortical bone and cancellous bone in the middle. But inside there, there's also a couple chambers, and these chambers are called sinuses. These sinuses are filled with air, and they're actually lined with the same type of mucous membrane that lines the inside of my nose, inside there. And they have a, 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 a channel or a duct that actually drains. So when it, the mucous membranes, guess what mucous membranes produce? Of course, they produce mucus. So I don't want that mucus to collect inside these frontal sinuses. They have to drain out. So there's a channel that drains. It drains into the into the middle portion of the nose. And we'll talk a little about that later on. When we talk about um, uh, the upper respiratory tract where these sinuses will drain to. But that up there, these are this. They could see how the frontal sinus is. It's interesting. If you want to do a little trick and you want to scare your friends and neighbors, you know, take a little pen light flashlight, okay, and then go into a dark room or go into a room. And then take the pen light, and if you take it and you stick it like right here, right up underneath your underneath your uh, uh, eyebrow, up in here, right in the corner, and then turn off the lights and turn on the pen light, those frontal sinuses sort of glow. They light up. So uh, I, I I would be wondering how many of this be, how many of you will be doing that tonight, just for the heck of it. But you'll actually see the front of the sinuses will glow. Um, they there'll be like a, a orange glow inside there. Why? Because it's 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 called transillumination. The the light actually passes through the thinner bone, and you can actually see it illuminated. You can actually do that with these down in here. Okay, this area down in here. These are called the maxillary sinuses right there. And you can do the same thing with that. If you take a if you take a flash that same pen light and put it here on your uh, on on your cheek, just next to your nose, right about here, and then turn off the light, turn on the pen light, and if you look at the roof of the mouth, the roof of your mouth will glow. Okay, because the roof of the mouth, like I say, is part maxilla, and these these maxillary sinuses are actually in the maxilla. They're large open areas that are in there. Okay, so we see those things Let's, on this uh, skull X-ray. What else do we see on the skull X-ray here? The orbits. Okay, we'll talk more about how those orbits are made. Okay, um, you see the nasal septum, which in here is going to be the vomer, deep deep further back. Here's obviously the mandible on the bottom. These, this is called the alveolar process down here. It's sort of like an airy area. That's, it's bone that's sort of like a lot of little air holes in it, and it's where those roots of the teeth will sit into. This area in here would be the maxilla, and this would be the alveolar process of the maxilla in this area right here. You can see a little bit of the zygomatic, what's called the zygomatic arch, you know, right there, okay? In there. Um, so anyway, those are just some things that you can see. Again, the problem with looking at chest, X, or excuse me, the problem with looking at skull X-rays is almost like what we talked about in some of the other um, um, uh, osteology PowerPoint videos. That thing called superimposition. There are so many things sitting on top of each other. It's sometimes very, very difficult to see something. You have to know what you're looking for in skull X-rays. They're really sometimes exceptionally difficult to read. And, and just to prove that, let me just go ahead and erase all these things and look at all the detail that you have there. What other X-ray have you seen so far that has that much detail? You, you, you don't have it. Okay. So that's one of the problems with dealing with and looking at, at skull X-rays. They're very difficult because so much superimposition. One thing on top of another thing on top of another thing. On top of another ring. And instead of having just a small bone, we have something that's 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 bigger in dimension. Uh, so you have more things that will overlap on top of each other. Okay. Uh, this here's back here is called the mastoid process. Mastoid process. Back in here, if you take your finger, stick it behind your ear, you feel that little bump behind your ear. That's the mastoid process. Okay. So these are just some things we'll be talking about.
Let's talk about the frontal bone. Okay, the frontal bone is basically the forehead. Okay, the forehead region is all the frontal bone, and everything here in yellow is the frontal bone. Okay, so that's the frontal bone up here. So that's the one we're concentrating on frontal bone okay uh, it articulates with the nasal bones here's the nasal bones right where it articulates right here with the nasal bones okay and the nasal bones are only these, these two little small they're paired one here and one there and we'll be talking about that a little bit later okay so it articulates inferior to the, with the nasal bones and then also right here with what's called the zygomatic bone the blue is the zygomatic bone it articulates right there with that also there's a little bit of articulation here with the maxilla which is that purple area, which is the upper upper jawbone, okay? Uh, the nasion, okay? This area right here is called the nasion. So the nasion would be this area right here, right at the bridge of the nose, right here, right there, where that where the nasal bones meet the frontal bone, that's called the nasion, the nasion, okay? There are a couple other, um, couple other landmarks that I want you to understand, you know, uh, from uh, this particular image here. The supraorbital margin. If, if you see the word margin, it means the edge of a bone, okay? So that supraorbital margin, if I'm going to draw where the supraorbital margin is, that's it right there. That's it right there. That's a supraorbital margin, okay? Supra means above, orbit. Orbit means the, the, the hole where the eyes are, and margin is the edge of the bone. So that's called the supraorbital margin, okay? Now, within that supraorbital margin, and let me get rid of those so you can actually see it a little bit better. Within that supraorbital margin, okay, is this supraorbital foramen or notch, and that's that little area right there, okay? See it right there, and we see it right there, okay? That little notch, it's right there right there okay and that notch if you ever see a notch or a hole like we talked about when we talked about foramen something's going through it okay um, nerve and stuff like that is going to go through that so that's a super orbital foramen or super or super orbital super orbital notch okay the next thing I want to show you here is a superciliary arch superciliary arch is this area Okay. Now, cilia means hair. So the superciliary arch is that bulge of the bone. If you feel the superorbital margin here, and above that, there's a little bit of a bulge, and that's where the eyebrows sit on. So that's a superciliary arch, which is the, the little the little um, uh, bulge of the bone that's going to be like right in here and right here above that super uh, superorbital margin. Okay, or, for, or super orbital margin. Okay, that's going to be the superciliary arch. Okay. So that's another another thing you should look at here. Um, frontal squama. Now, squama just means the bone itself. So basically, if we're talking about the frontal squama, that's it. The frontal squama is the bone. Okay. Uh, so that's what we see with that. So we'll forget that that um, the zygomatic process. Okay. Now what happens is you can't see it really well in here. We'll see it a little bit later on. And what happens is the, the zygomatic bone is again this cheekbone that sits right here. And that zygomatic bone comes up and meets at the portion of the orbit about the right at the side here. You can almost sometimes feel a little a little edge. I can feel it right there, and I can sort of feel it right there. And that's where the zygomatic bone meets the frontal bone. Okay. OK, so the, the frontal bone comes down to meet that. Um, and as a result, also the zygomatic bone will come and meet the maxilla, you know, right about in here at the lower portion of the orbit. And then it comes this way and there'll be a little um, uh, 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 what's called the zygomatic process, which actually goes back towards the ear. You can't see it here. You'll see it better. It comes and I'll show you a fracture of a zygomatic process a little bit later. OK, so but we can't really see it on either of these either of these images. And the last thing I want to just mention is the frontal signs. Now, I can't see that, but that's that area. And sometimes there's three, sometimes there's four, sometimes there's more little um, bulbous looking areas that are that are actually uh, in a low density. When I say low density, I mean darker. If I say high density, I mean whiter. OK, on an X-ray. And that's what we see now because we saw in a previous previous that previous film. OK, this is just looking at a real skull and looking at it. And you can actually sort of follow follow the guidelines here. Here's the here's the top of the nasal bones right here. So this area, this is all frontal bone right here. And you can actually see right here where the frontal bone meets the zygomatic bone because this is the zygomatic bone here. Here's the zygomatic bone right here. OK, here's the superciliar. Oh, here's the superorbital margin. Here's that foramen, superorbital foramen or notch. OK, uh, this would be the super. You can always get a little impression. So there's like a little whitish area right there. This is the superciliary, you know, uh, ridge that's it's up in there. OK, uh, 
And that's pretty much what we see here. And you can't see the sinuses because again, they're inside the bone like we talked about before, but that's basically the frontal bone. Okay, so you should be able to see that. I'm gonna remove these so you can actually take a look at it. You can stop the video if you wanna look at that and compare it with the diagram that's on the, on the right, okay? Give you a couple seconds to do that. Okay, we're gonna head on now. This is just looking at another skull x-ray, and this is the frontal bone. Wow, that looks really exciting. You actually see the frontal sinus, see it's multiple. In this case, there's more, you know, multiple lobules, which is what you see. And they're not, always, they don't always have to be symmetrical, but you know, they're there, okay? So that's just, that's just called, that's just the frontal sinus. One thing I'm gonna show you here, which we, which we didn't talk about, okay? Uh, but it's gonna come up a little bit later when we talk about the cranial base, is if you look here in the middle, see that little area right there that sticks up, that white area? That area is called the crista galli, the crista galli, everybody remembers that. Right, this bone right here, okay? is called the ethmoid bone, okay? And we'll see that when you look inside the skull and, and the cranial base from the, the internal view. And basically that has small little holes in it, which is called the cribriform plate. And uh, there's a, a, a nerve that comes out right, right from the bottom of the brain, which is the first cranial nerve, which is called the olfactory nerve. It comes straight along and it finally ends right on both sides of this cristigalli. And there's small little holes in this cribriform plate and little nerve fibers will go down through that and that's for smell. Okay, and this actually separates, it sticks up between the, the frontal lobe on the right side of the brain and the frontal lobe on the left side of the brain. It sticks up in between, it's, it looks like, they call it the coxcomb, coxcomb, comb. It's like the, the rooster with the thing up in the middle, the, the, the comb that's on the top. So that's what they call it, the, the, it's the crystal which means the coxcomb, okay? So we'll show you that a little bit more when we get inside, but it shows it nice on this X right here. So I thought it'd be nice to show. You can see what's called, the, here's the ethmoid sinus. And right in here, you see the ethmoid sinus right there. Ethmoid sinus is right there, okay? And uh, there are actually a number of bones that have sinuses, okay? The frontal bone has a sinus. The ethmoid bone has sinus. The sphenoid bone has sinuses. And the maxillary has sinuses. So there's actually four bones of the cranium that have these sinuses. And all of them, again, are holes within, you know, a large cavity or chamber inside the bone, which is lined with that mucous membrane that makes mucus that drains into the nose. Okay, now the orbit. Orbits are a really tough thing to understand because <clears throat> if I look at the picture, especially this one down here, you can see that what happens. Look at all those different colors. All those colors mean something that's different. I mean, I mean, show me that there's there's a number of bones that contribute to that orbit or that socket <clears throat> that the eye is in. Okay. Now, there are a couple landmarks that we could get to before we actually talk about which bones are which. Okay. First is the superior and inferior orbital fissure. There's a superior orbital fissure, which is a crack. You can see it right there, okay? You get this, that would be the same thing right there. It'd be the same thing right there, okay? The inferior, that it should go superior right there. The inferior orbital fissure, and let me do that with blue. I'll do the inferior orbital fissure. You can't see it a whole lot. You can see a little bit right down there. You can see a little bit maybe right down in here. You can see it a little bit down here and right down here. And actually what happens is if you were to look at the back of the eye, you'd actually see a, a, like a, a sideways V back in there. Be sideways V, sideways V. And the top part would be the superior orbital fissure. The bottom part would be the inferior orbital fissure, okay? Now, what are those fissures for? Um, the fissures are, 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 again, if you have a fissure or a foramen, it means something goes through them. They're, they're not just there for, for beauty's sake or anything like that, okay? or for a bragging rights, but something goes through it. Um, your eyes, okay? Uh, there are six muscles that supply, or that, that, that make your eyes move in all different directions, only six. Uh, one on the top, one on the bottom, one on the inside, one on the outside, and then two that are coming obliquely. They come through a sling that are actually rotary muscles. One's called the inferior oblique, one's called the superior oblique, okay? So there are six muscles. They're supplied by three nerves that come directly from the brain. The third cranial nerve, the fourth cranial nerve, and the sixth cranial nerve, okay? Uh, the oculomotor, the trochlear, and the abducens nerve, okay? And what they do is, how do they get to the eye? How do they get to those eye muscles? Through those, frame, through those fissures, okay? And a fissure means a crack in something, okay? So that's that. The other thing that we want to show back in here as a landmark inside the socket is the optic canal. And you can see the optic canal right there. You can see it right there, okay? You can see it right there, and you can see it 
right there. Now, that is the canal that has the nerve that leaves the eye for vision. It's called the optic nerve or cranial nerve two. Okay, so the cranial nerve two goes through that hole right there, that hole right there, that hole right there, that hole right there. Now it has a really interesting root, and I'm going to show you when we get inside the inside the cranium how that root is. It's really sort of cool. Okay, and it does something special with the eyes that doesn't happen in too many places in the body. And you can amaze your friends and family, and if they're not interested, if you have a dog or something like that, maybe the dog will be. Dogs are pretty faithful; they'll listen to anything you say you say to them usually and stuff like that. So anyway, that's called the optic canal and that's for the second cranial nerve or the optic nerve okay so let's get rid of that okay what else do we have here let's talk about the bones now of the orbit what bones make up the orbit well first of all the maxilla maxilla is going to be this purple and you can see this part of the orbit right here is made up by the maxilla okay so the maxilla makes up that part right there okay the zygomatic bone makes up this part right here So, because the blue is the zygomatic bone, so now I have the maxilla and the zygomatic bone taking up uh, taking up a lot of that of that orbit. Okay, uh, the next one I have this this one's going to be a little bit more difficult. Okay, and this is going to be the lacrimal bone, and this is the lacrimal bone right here. Okay, lacrimal bone right here. It's just on the inside. You can actually see the lacrimal bone would be like right about here, right about here. I should have done that, shouldn't I? I mean, look at okay. Here's the maxilla right here. Here's the maxilla right here. Here's the zygomatic bone right here. Here's the zygomatic bone right there. And now we see our lacrimal bone that's inside the orbit more so than the rim. Okay. Next we have is the frontal bone. Frontal bone we know is going to be this area right here. This area right here is going to be the frontal bone. Going to be frontal bone. All that yellow stuff is frontal. Is frontal, and that pretty much completes the 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 rim of the orbit with the maxilla, maxilla with the zygomatic and the frontal bone con completing most of the rim. Okay, there's another bone in here, and you really can't see it a whole lot here because it's sort of tucked way inside there, and that's called the ethmoid bone. Okay, the ethmoid bone would be up in here, deep deep inside, like like if you actually maybe you can see it right there a little bit. Okay. And so like right down in that area, you're going to see the ethmoid bone. It's going to be right down there. It's deep inside the orbit. Okay. And that's called the ethmoid bone. Okay. I actually undid my, my uh, lacrimal bone. Sphenoid bone. Okay. Now, if you want to have your mind blown, okay, get a PhD in the sphenoid. Sphenoid is one crazy, uh, crazy, crazy, crazy bone. And that's this one in here. Okay. I should have done it with, let me do it in purple, make it better. That's a sphenoid bone in here. That's a sphenoid bone in here. Sphenoid actually is a bone that actually looks like a butterfly. Okay, it actually has three wings. Okay, or two wings. Excuse me, four wings. To, four wings, two on each side. A major wing and a, and a minor wing on each side. Okay, and that's a sphenoid bone. It's a very complex bone. It's one of those bones that that have so many crazy things involved with it. Okay, and so that's the that's the sphenoid bone. We'll talk a little bit more about the sphenoid bone, sphenoid bone when we get on, uh, when we look more at the cranial base, both on the inside and the outside. And the and the, and the seventh bone is sort of like a you know give or take you know, and that's the palatine bone, and you really can't see it. It's going to be sitting deep down in the orbit down in that area. Okay, so that's what makes up the area of the orbit. You should be able to follow these different colors. Let me get rid of my lines so you can see what these lines are and you can compare it with the skull on the top as to what you have on the bottom, you know, with the colors on the bottom. And that makes up the seven bones of the orbit. So I think that I probably want to remember these are the seven bones of the orbit. That always comes up somewhere at some point like with questions and answers and stuff like that. I don't know. Hint, hint. Okay. So I think I would know. This is just looking at an, at uh, uh, a representation. This is a drawing. And you can actually see if, we, if we're looking here, this would be the, the rim that's going to be the maxillary bone. Here's the rim that's going to be the zygomatic bone. bone, And here's the rim that's the frontal bone that's right in here. You can actually see this, the sphenoid bone. That can, here's the sphenoid bone. Here we see when we look in here, we see our supraorbital fissure, infraorbital fissure. Here's the optic foramen or optic canal. It's in there. Okay, uh, you can't really see much lacrimal bone here. And this one over here, we can. <clears throat> we could look at all these different individual bones. <clears throat> here you can see the ethmoid a little bit better in there. Ethmoid's going to be right in here. Here's the lacrimal. It's right behind the lacrimal bone. Okay, you know, and, and right in there. Here's the maxilla down in here. We see our zygomatic bone 
over here. Okay, we see the frontal bone up here. Here's the supraorbital notch or supraorbital uh, uh, fissure. It's or, or foramen that's up there sometimes. Uh, let's see, uh, sphenoid bone. Here's the sphenoid bone sitting back in there. So you can see the sphenoid bone sitting back in there. And again, his, this is the crack between one wing and another wing, that little crack in there. So anyway, that's just looking at a, a, a real skull to, to be able to see where everything is. And I'll let you look at those. This is pretty well, pretty well identified where everything is inside the, inside the orbit. You do see the uh, fissures, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, both the uh, uh, inferior and superior orbital fissures pretty, really well in this, this. Here's the superior orbital fissure. You can see right in here, you can see the inferior orbital fissure here. And then here's the optic canal or optic foramen. Okay, very nice, nice picture. This is just looking at a radiograph of the of the orbit, so we can see the orbital rim. Here's going to be a frontal bone, going to be sitting up in here. We see this would be the zygomatic bone in here. The maxilla would be in here. Okay, maxilla, and the zygomatic bone is already in here. Okay, so you can pretty much follow that as well. You can't see many of the other other bones that are in there. You can't see the division of them. We also see in here what's this. Here's my frontal sinus. See how irregular it is? Could be multiple little lobes inside there. Here's the uh, here's that piriform aperture of the nose, that pear-shaped aperture of the nose. Here's the maxillary sinus, the sinus that's inside the maxilla. Okay, you can see that pretty well. Okay, so those are pretty obvious to see. Again, this is the same thing. This is this this is here's the front. You can see the frontal sinus. What they're doing is now they're looking upwards instead of looking straight ahead, they're gazing upwards a little bit. So you're actually seeing inside the nose. This would be the area of the vomer, right in here, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Here's the you can see the frontal sinus up in in this area. Here's the here's the superior rim of the orbit. Here's the inferior rim of the orbit. Okay, inferior rim of the orbit, superior rim of the orbit, and the eye would be sitting in here. Okay, some of his blue eyes, okay? So blue eyes sitting there. That's a scary looking picture. Anyway, so this is just another x-ray showing the same thing we showed that before. We see that nasal septum down here. I think this is the same one we had before. Nasal septum down there. Um, but it doesn't show you a whole lot more. We do see the maxillary sinus right here. We don't see it as well on this side. You see a little bit of the orbit here just from a different view, okay? You can see the frontal sinus right there. Again, that frontal sinus doesn't have to be symmetrical or even, okay? It doesn't have to be. This is just looking at it from a little different view. Um, <clears throat> and you can see here's the orbit right here. So the superior portion up here is going to be the frontal bone. This area in here would be maxilla. And uh, this, this area out here is going to be the zygomatic. You can see the zygoma here. There's a little archway that goes back. I'll show you the arch in just a little bit. You can see the frontal sinuses sitting up in there. Here's the maxillary sinuses, nice and clear. Why are they black? Why are they black? Because in most cases, because they're drained, they're filled with air. Sometimes what's going to happen is you can actually see a sinus, and there'll be a line across it, and it'll be white below that line. Okay, And you'll see a straight line, and then it's going to be white below. And that's just basically what's called an air fluid level. We'll see these multiple places. And that just means there's, there's mucus and, and snot inside there that's actually fallen. Okay. And the air rises, fluid will fall. That's all there is to it. Mandible sort of printed out in pink here. Okay. Let's talk about these, the, the, the zygomatic arch. I've mentioned this a couple times. Okay. And this is the zygoma. Again, that bone is the zygoma right there, the zygomatic bone right in, in there. <clears throat> the zygomatic bone, we know, meets the frontal bone up in here. Okay, so here's the, where the zygomatic bone meets the frontal bone. Right here is where it meets the sphenoid, because that pink is going to be the sphenoid. Sphenoid is that little pink area right there, the salmon color. This bone right here, okay, the large one right here, is a temporal bone. We haven't mentioned that so far temporal bone. Now this is sort of sort of cool. We'll talk more about the temporal bone at the very end of this. What happens is, so here's my zygomatic bone. It comes to here where the end of the blue is. So everything that's light blue is a zygomatic bone. What happens is it starts to per, per, go, go posterior this way. But what happens is the temporal bone right here sends out a bar that comes this way like this forward. Okay, so this area right here, okay, 
let me just draw let me just draw it by a circle this area right here where it's going back to meet the rest of that bar is called the temporal process of the zygomatic bone the temporal process of the zygomatic bone this process right here is called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone they're just you know you got the the one process of the opposite bone and then you have the other process of the opposite bone you know, back and forth so this the red again is going to be the temporal process of the zygomatic bone and the blue is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone and what they do is they meet they create an archway okay now if you look again you can see it really well here so here's where the where the zygomatic bone ends okay and that would so this right here would this right here would be the <clears throat> the area of the temporal process of the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic bone brings out this little bar that comes out this way which is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone well back inside here is an open area is an open area here's what i want you to do right now take your hands and stick it on the side of your head and, and just a little bit in front of uh and uh, at the near the top of your ear okay just do that go ahead do that good don't put your put your pens down come on please okay do it come on oh anyway put your hands right there okay now why don't you is i want you to bite down do it a couple times relax a couple times relax what do you feel you feel that area where you're feeling is you can feel your, your fingers are somewhere right around here and it's getting tight it's getting tight well, what this zygomatic process does is it not only provides a little bit of a cheek contour and a protection, okay, but what happens is in this area right here, there's a muscle that fills that area. It's called the temporalis muscle for some strange reason. Yeah, right. Okay, and the temporalis muscle actually comes, it comes together and it goes underneath. It goes through this gap. It goes underneath, it goes through this gap and attaches to this little bump on the mandible right here. This little bump that sits right up on the mandible right there. That's what that, that muscle will attach to. So as a result, um, when you bite down, you can feel it getting tight because the muscle in here is getting tight as you're pulling your jaw up and closing your jaw. Okay? That's a temporalis muscle, the temporalis muscle that will be in there. It's also there for another good purpose. Okay? And we'll talk about this later on. Okay? But I'm going to mention it really quick here. If you look right here, this is a very interesting area, okay? It has a special name. It's called the terion, P-T-E-R-I-O-N, terion, okay? And it's an area where four cranial bones come together. I have my temporal bone coming from here, okay? This up bone up here would be called the parietal bone, P-A-R-I-E-T-A-L, parietal bone, okay? And that's up here. That's that little area right there, okay? Here's my frontal bone right there and then the sphenoid bone is right there so if these four bones actually come together and what they do is they create an H okay and that H is called the terion okay now why is that so significant who cares other bones come together you see that same H right here see that little H the reason why that's significant is that's sort of a weak area of the skull it's a weak area of the skull okay and so therefore by taking that uh, temporalis muscle and putting it over there it provides bulk just like remember we talked about the scapula the scapula is very thin but you don't see too many things happen with the scapula why because it's covered with so much muscle okay so this temporalis muscle covers over this area it actually protects that now that's sort of important okay it's sort of important because okay and we won't see it here but just behind up in up in up in this area back here there's going to be a little hole in the skull and there's a little branch that comes off of the external carotid that actually goes up and across it cuts right through there on the inside of the skull and it's called the middle meningeal artery it supplies blood arterial blood to the area of the meninges of the covering of the brain the outer outer layers of the brain okay and that runs almost right underneath that terion so therefore we need protection if the skull is very thin there i need some more protection so that temporal this is called the temporal fossa this whole area is called the temporal fossa and that's what that that muscle fills that area so just a little bit of a of a of a little bit of information i don't know about you guys but uh my son called me um 
uh, the other night, uh, Saturday, probably Saturday night, <clears throat> says, hey, listen, um, the uh, UFC is on from Jacksonville. He used to live in Jacksonville and stuff like that. And they started USC fights and stuff. And he said, you might want to watch and you know so a couple of them were you know a guy gets clocked and it gets hit there and i'm saying oh jeez you know we'll talk more about this later on when we talk about the neurological system but um you know i've seen uh, there's a uh, there was a, a boxer from from uh, youngstown um ray mancini or boom boom mancini think about it. if you want to go look at this and google it boom boom mancini and what happened was he was in a he was a, a, a um i think a maybe a welterweight or middle, I mean, I forget what the weight, what weight class he was in, but he was a champion of that weight class, okay? <clears throat> the, the, the world champion of the weight class. And uh, he was fighting a guy named uh, Duck Tu Kim from Korea. And he hit him right there, you know? X marks the spot, hit him right there, and the guy went down, okay? Uh, but uh, 24 hours later, he was dead, okay? Why? From bleeding. You know, probably a rupture of the middle meningeal artery that's right underneath there. Um, Liam Neeson's wife, <clears throat> they were in uh, Europe somewhere skiing in some remote area in Europe skiing. And she was on a little bunny hill, you know, forget, you know, f you know, try to figure this out. She's on a little bunny hill and fell down, hit her head. And what happened was by the time they life flighted her out of there and got her to the hospital forever, wherever it was, she died. And probably because bleeding, because this area right here is sort of a vulnerable area. OK, so anyway, that's a little bit about that. But anyway, that's a little bit off offhand. So I think you should know the zygomatic bone, which is the temporal process of the zygomatic right there. And then we have the temporal bone with the zygomatic process right there. And that creates this archway. Now, the archway is sort of like a protection there as well, uh, you know, over the top of the, the muscle. And the muscle goes underneath there to attach to this area in, in, in the mandible right in there. OK. Also, right where that zygomatic process starts, the temporal bone, there's a little notch in there. And that's where the temporal mandibular joint sits right in there. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Or I'll talk about that when we talk about the cranial base more. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's a little bit about that. These th uh, I've seen people also will get fractures of this. And I'll show you a picture of a fracture of the zygomatic bone here. This is just looking at the zygomatic bone here. Here's the zygomatic bone here. You can see it outlined here. Pretty much what we'd expect. So this right here would be the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. And this is right where the zygomatic bone meets the frontal bone because we all know very well that that's the frontal bone. And this is where the zygomatic bone meets the maxilla, big max, mad max is up in here. Okay. So that's a little about the zygomatic bone. You should know that. Now, if we look at this x-ray we had before, there's the zygomatic arch. And that's that archway that goes over the top. And this is actually distorted because of the view. This is a view with the head really far back and taking the x-ray this way, okay? I couldn't tell if I was seeing it. You are seeing it on the video, but that's the way they'd be taking it. We saw this view before, okay? Here's another one. This is a little bit better, okay? And what, what happens if we look at this, here's a zygomatic arch right there. Here's a zygomatic arch. So this area right here, that's a zygomatic arch. A zygomatic arch. And you can see that gap. See that gap underneath there? That's that gap with a temporalis muscle. We'll run under, so you can see the gap underneath in there, and that's the gap where the temporalis muscle will run underneath there. What's wrong here? Well, that one's normal. Oop, there's a depressed fracture. So if we look here, here's the normal zygomatic arch, and whoops, there it goes, and there's the fracture sitting right there. So that's, and it's funny because what, these, you can, almost don't even need an x-ray. All you need to do is look at a person from the top down, stand on stand the top, your head would be up, up in here. You look down over their cheek, and look at the contour of their cheek, one cheek is there, one cheek is flat. Go figure why, because this is all flattened out, okay? So that's a fracture of the zygomatic process on this side, okay? Or the zygomatic arch. It's actually really the arch, okay? Because the zygomatic process is both coming from both the temporal bone and the zygom zyg zygomatic bone, okay? But it's a, a fracture of the zygomatic arch, because that's an arch, an arch. Uh, the nasal region, okay? The nasal region is interesting because what happens is uh, you, know, you always got this, the picture of the skull in the, in the pirate movies and stuff like that. But this area right here is called the piriform aperture. It's, it's piriform, like pear-shaped, okay? It's anteriorly. So it's a pear-shaped aperture, and about two-thirds of it is maxilla. So if we look from here to about here, this area right here is all by the maxilla, okay? And only this top part is from the nasal bones. I have two little nasal bones that are sitting up in the top. So everything down the bottom is from the maxilla. The other 
third up at the top are where the nasal bones are there. Okay. What happens is between the right and the left side of the nose, I have what's called that, na that nasal septum. Let me just draw it in a different color here, the nasal septum right there. And again, what happens is anteriorly, if you take your nose and you wheel it around, okay, it's flexible because the septum anteriorly is um, cartilage. But when I get deeper inside the nose, back inside the skull, back in here, okay, back in this area right right in here particularly okay this area right here is called the vomer and it's a very hard it's a bone that actually divides the right and the left side of the nose okay we also have in the nose what are called the nasal conche nasal conche okay and these are sort of curved bony plates these are plates like that curved bony plates like that they sit now the reason why we have those nasal conche are physiological okay what happens is you, if you look inside your nose okay if you take i don't know you guys have an endoscope uh, i have a little endoscope that I hook up to my phone so like it looks like a little pen okay a little small thing has a light on the end so if you if you drop something underneath like a uh you know, a desk or something like that, you could, and you can't get back there, you can actually take your little endoscope and look and stuff like that. But, you know, medically, I've done some really weird things with the endoscope. Don't tell people, you know. I've looked down the back of my throat so I can see my vocal cords with the endoscope. I've stuck it back in my nose as far as it will go. I haven't told people when I have the endoscope. But what they don't know won't hurt them, okay? But anyway, you can see it back in the, in the back of the nose. But if you look inside your nose, if you have an endoscope and look inside, the nose, don't go way back, okay? Please don't do that. You know, I'll get in trouble. Although when they, you know, when they start doing the test for the COVID-19, they take the swab and stick it all the way to the very back of the uh, of the nasal pharynx, which is until it hits a wall in the back where the adenoids are. Okay, but anyway, um, if you look at the inside of the nose, if you look, put, push your nose up, and you'll see these little bulgy things. There's three of them. You can see um, the, this is called the inferior one. This is the middle one. There's a very small one that's high up in the nose. Okay, uh, but there's three, and the reason why they're there is they're covered with mucous membranes. What do mucous membranes do? They make mucus. Okay, so that what they they become sticky, and so when I breathe in through my nose, which is a better way to breathe breathe simply because um, uh, it humidifies because of the moisture inside my nose uh, it traps all that a lot of the debris the little uh, particles and grunge that you're breathing in it traps that sticks the mucus comes out as you know that, that you know whether it's not that you know booger material or whatever you want to talk about you know, it comes out like a big crunchy thing okay if you do any nasal mining you know what I'm talking about okay but uh, that's in there and then um, uh, it also um, uh, uh, warms because the mucous membranes are very vascular. And as a result, it warms the air as it comes through the nose. So by adding more shelves inside the nose, it increases the surface area, which improves all three of those. It improves the humidification because I have more surface area for moisture. It improves, it improves the trapping of debris because I have more places that things could stick to. And it also increases the warm because I have mu more mucous membrane with a greater vascular blood supply that will warm the air. Okay. And so what happens is these little bony shelves are covered with that mucous membrane. And those bony shelves are called conche. Conche. Okay. So these are the nasal conche that are in there. The inferior nasal conche is all by itself. The superior comes off the other bones. Okay, this is just looking inside, looking at the at the at the frontal area. And again, here's my piriform aperture. You see the vomer sitting back in there. Here's the nasal bone right here. Here's the nasal bone right here. And basically everything in here is all the way up through here is going to be the. This is going to be that's all the maxilla. So the maxilla is all this area right here. That's the whole maxilla. See the same thing here. Here's the nasal bones up in there. Here's the piriform aperture right here. Here's that inferior nasal concave right there. There's the vomer sitting in the middle and all this in here is still going to be maxilla. Okay. Just like we show, well, like we saw on the other, on the other uh, bone. Here's the zygomatic bone, which is going to be this portion of the orbit right here. This portion of the orbit is going to be the zygomatic bone right here, but this portion of the orbit is going to be maxilla, that orbital ridge. Okay, so anyway, yeah, it's pretty easy. You could probably see that we've talked about the inferior nasal concha. We've talked about uh, actually up in the top. You also see a perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. We'll talk more about the ethmoid bone again a little bit later. We talked a little about that before. Nasal bone. Here's the superior orbital margin of the frontal bone. Lacrimal bone is sitting deep inside. It's down like right, right number 18. It's sitting right inside there, inside the orbit. Okay, so basically that's what we've seen so far. I'll remove this and give you a chance to. To look at it if you want. Okay. This is just looking at nasal bones from the side. Okay, and you can see this is the nose. Okay, so you can follow the nose contour out here. Here's a nostril right there. You can see a nostril. Okay, 
here's the upper lip okay uh, and you can see the nasal bones here's the nasal bone right here okay um, so if it's if it's a fracture it might be bent down or whatever the case may be and you see how this is all air filled in there how it's all more soft tissue okay because it's more cartilage finally when I get back in here I'm going to get back into the vomer this is again here's the piriform there's the you know here's the area of the of the piriform uh, uh, aperture okay your maxillary air science this one you don't see it as well it's a little bit denser okay but that's what we see there another view again a lot of superimposition let's talk about the maxilla the maxilla is the upper jaw okay is the upper jaw it's and what happens is the maxilla actually comes together during development comes from both sides and it meets in the middle okay if you look at the top lip okay the top lip there's like a, a little crease up here a little trough between the two where the where the, where the where the between the two uh where the septum would be comes straight down and that's called the philtrum p-h-i-l-t-r-u-m p-h-i-l-t-r-u-m the philtrum okay and and that's normally there okay what happens is it sort of shows where the maxilla comes to the side and it'll unite in the middle there'll be a union area right in the middle sometimes that fails to unite and that's when we have that cleft lip and that cleft palate okay because what happens is that maxa supplies the two-thirds the anterior two-thirds of the roof of the hard portion of the roof of my mouth is going to be the maxilla okay so that maxilla is united in what's called the intermaxillary suture right in the middle right underneath where that philtrum is that little that little trough in the upper lip okay uh, it surrounds most of the piriform aperture at least two-thirds of it the upper portions by the nasal bones like we talked about before we talked about how it contributes a good third of that infraorbital margin on the medial side okay we talk about how it connects to the zygomatic bones laterally to continue out the, the rest of that orbit and stuff like that there are a couple uh, landmarks that will show you uh, the inferior orbital fissure and the inferior oral fissure or foramen guess what that's for the same thing as a superior on the fundal bone for 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 a nerve to come out there's a the nerve that actually there's there's two nerves that are really important for the face one's called the trigeminal nerve and the trigeminal nerve actually provides a sensation to all my face okay if you take it you touch everywhere it's by cranial nerve five it's the fifth cranial nerve cranial nerve five which is called the trigeminal nerve okay and cranial nerve seven cranial nerve seven is called the facial nerve and the facial nerve supplies the muscles that make my face do all kinds of strange things all kinds of strange faces it's because it supplies what are called the muscles of facial expression okay we'll talk about that more later on when we get to the nervous system okay we have the maxillary sinus and I'll show you exactly where the maxillary sinus we've seen it before okay uh, I'll tell you and when we get there I'll, I'll tell you something interesting about the maxillary sinus the alveolar process what happens is alveolo al alveoli or alveolar means airy when we look at the lungs the lungs are going to have these little air sacs and those little air sacs are called alveoli okay but if I look at bone sometimes bone looks very porous okay and if I if I was to take off the gums and pull the gums out and pull the the teeth out the the the, the, the uh, bone where the teeth stick in is very porous or very whoop, alveolar okay it's a lot it's a lot of a lot of air holes inside this so that's called the alveolar process and those are the sockets that the teeth will stick in we have our maxillary teeth okay we have our infraorbital foramen okay which is also for something to pass out nerve to pass out and then the palatine process of the maxilla again if you have a clean finger okay if you have a dirty finger again no try not to touch your mouth and stuff like that without washing your hands if you take your finger after you wash your hands and feel the roof of your mouth it's hard okay and the majority of that hard palate of the roof of the mouth is by the maxima by the maxilla okay let's show talk about here and again so let's look at those at those landmarks okay we have uh inferior orbital fissure and in or inferior orbital foramen okay uh, so it's, you will see it yeah you know, just the, there's a couple little foramen that are that are here you know and uh, here's the infraorbital foramen which is actually this one right here but sometimes there's a little notch that sits right here just like we saw with the superior orbital it sits right there and that would be called the inferior orbital fissure or inferior orbital orbital, orbital foramen okay the maxillary sinus you can't see it here the maxillary sinus will be sitting right in here we sitting right in here We'll be sitting right in here would we'll be sitting right in here okay uh, the alveolar process that would be this portion of the maxilla here this portion of the maxilla if you pull the teeth out what happens is that 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 uh, uh, holy type of 
you know, a, a porous type of bone that where the, where the teeth would sit. And these are obviously the maxillary teeth, okay? Uh, infraorbital foramen. And the palatine process we can't see because we have to get inside the mouth to be able to see that. That's that hard, the front portion, the front two-thirds of the hard palate, for two-thirds to almost three-quarters of the hard palate is, the, is, the, is from the maxillary. Okay. This is again looking at the same thing we saw before. You know, here's the infraorbital foramen right there. You can't see much. There's a little, sometimes a little notch you'll see in that area right here. This would be the alveolar process. You can't see the maxillary sinus. Be in here. It would be in here. Here's the alveolar teeth. You can't see the, the the roof of the mouth. So we haven't talked about that yet. We talked about here. Here's the maxilla meeting the zygomatic bone right there at that little. Oh, one thing I should mention. I think I, I, we we talked about this earlier in another. When we talked about general basic osteology principles, what happens is if I look where the, the cranial bones come together, these bones are sort of like jagged, okay? And you can see that 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 jagged line, there'll be a jagged line right here where the maxilla comes together this way and this way. But we see all these other jagged line right here, jagged line right here. You can see uh, that jagged line. If I if I you see that little jagged line right there, these are called suture lines. Suture lines. Okay, when you get those plastic skulls from like Marks and Walmart and stuff like that before Halloween, you see all those little squiggly lines. Those are suture lines. Okay, and that's where the bones come together. Uh, they're initially open, but then they're, they're like teeth. And these little teeth will interdigitate with each other and they become very firm at that point. Maybe sutures a suture. You can all see the cell suture lines in there. You can all see the cell suture lines it's like there, there, there. Yeah, see suture lines right there. That's what those are. Here's the maxillary sinus right there on the one side, and let's see, there's the one on the other side. There's a little bit of a difference. Again, this one over here is very dark because it's full of air, okay? That makes it dark. And then this one over here is a little bit less dark. There might be a little bit more mucus and stuff in that, but that's the maxillary sinus. Interesting thing about this, okay? I mentioned there are four sinuses, or four bones with sinuses. Frontal bone, the sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxilla, okay? Um, so what happens is the frontal bone is high, and it's going, and so the nose sits right here. Let's say, the, let me put, a, let me draw a nose right here. Here's a nose. Okay. The frontal bone drains down into the into that area of the nasal cavity. The sphenoid bone, actually, it's you know, actually, I should probably put the ethmoid bone here and the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is a little bit lower. Let me just change those real quick so that. We won't get anybody confused, okay? So let's put the ethmoid bone here because we know that that's on the inside of the orbit. Sphenoid bone is sort of like the back of the orbit. So the ethmoid bone still drains down. Sphenoid bone still drains down. Maxilla doesn't. It drains across. The maxilla bone, maxillary sinus doesn't drain very well because it has to go sideways. And the think about gravity would allow things to drain downwards. Okay, if you have fluids, everything is going going downwards. That's the flow. Okay, gravity takes fluids down. How in the maxillary sinus, if the, if the sinus was like this, the sinus is actually like this. The, the duct that goes to the nose for the maxillary sinus comes out this way to go inside the nose. It's at the top of the sinus. It's not the bottom of the sinus, but it's at the top. So as a result, the maxillary sinus has a difficult time draining. So a lot of people will have a lot of problems with the maxillary sinus. So when you have a cold or something like that, you start to get that pain below your eyes. That's because what happens, the mucous membranes, they're in the back of the nose, swell. They get irritated and inflamed. They swell and they shut off. They shut off that tube and the maxillary sinus can't drain. So what does it do? It fills up with more mucus. Mucus levels in there, mucus gets in there, and more mucus, and more mucus, and more mucus, and more mucus. Finally, the whole maxillary sinus is full. Puts pressure against the wall of that maxillary sinus, are those mucous membranes. The, the mucous membranes are also supplied by that fifth cranial nerve, or the trigeminal nerve, and that's what causes the pain. Okay? Oh, that gets me to a good point. Ooh, I'm going to solve a mystery of life for all of you here. Something that, you know, if you, if you, if you didn't get through uh, A&P and didn't learn this, you'd say, I, I, I really missed something. You could, and, and you could have the right to call the dean and say, I just didn't do my job. Okay. But brain freeze. Mm, okay. What is brain freeze? Everybody's probably had brain freeze. You're eating something, something cold, and all of a sudden you get this terrible type, you know, like really boring, like a head pain. Well, what happens is the roof of the mouth and that area there is also supplied by cranial nerve. Guess what? Cranial nerve five, trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve also supplies, besides the face, the sinuses, the mucous membranes inside the sinuses, but also supplies 
the meninges or the coverings of the brain inside the cranium. So when I get that area cold, that nerve gets is, is picking up that cold and it causes pain. If you put cold on something for a while, it becomes very painful. Okay, so as a result, that pain is picked up by that trigeminal nerve on the roof of the mouth, but the brain can't determine is it coming from the roof of the mouth or is it coming from the meninges or the covering of the brain. And that's what it feels like you get that you get that terrible headache and it goes away. You're actually it's the fifth cranial nerve. So when people have brain freeze, what I want you to immediately pop up and say, that's the fifth cranial nerve, try have trigeminal nerve that's causing that pain. Okay? And they'll never buy ice cream for you ever again. Okay, but uh, anyway, that's what that's what that's all about. Okay, there's a special name for it, and it has to do about the trigeminal nerve, but you won't remember that anyway. So um, anyway, but that's a little bit interesting thing. But anyway, that's the maxillary sinus. You can see how nice and open this one is, where this one's a little bit cloudier, more filled with more mucus. Okay, let's talk about the mandible. Okay, and we're going to be uh, getting towards the end of this. Mandible is the lower jaw. Okay, and it's a it's a separate bone, and you can actually pull the mandible right off if you want. Okay, um, uh, there's a number of of things here that we should talk about with the mandible. A number of parts. It's a small bone, but there's a number of parts. Okay, so let me try to identify each of these parts that we have. The body. This is the body of the, of the mandible. This area in here. This area in here. This area in here is called the body of the mandible. Okay, the angle. The angle is this area right here. It's that area right there. Now, take your hand, you stick it right here, and you see where that big uh, um, lump of bone is right here at the, I can't know if I'm in the, right there, right there, and right there, where the bottom of the jaw is, that's the angle. You know why they call it the angle? Because it's it's an angle, of course, okay? It's called the, that's called the angle, okay? So we have the body and the angle, okay? Let's get rid of those. The mental protuberance, okay? What happens is mental, we talked about earlier in the year, means chin, okay? Means chin. So this area in here would be the mental protuberance would be in that area right there. It's the triangular area where the where the where the chin sort of protrudes. Okay, uh, the mandibular symphysis. And the mandibular symphysis is just like the maxillary symphysis. Symphysis means coming together, and that's this right here, right in the middle, where the the mandible actually comes from both sides and fuses in the middle as well. Okay. Uh, where, we, where the maxilla frequently doesn't fuse and we get the cleft lip and the cleft palate, which then needs either surgical correction or a prosthesis or something like that, because everything in the mouth then goes up in the nose if the, if the, palate's, if the palate's still split apart. Okay? But the, the, that rarely ha would rarely happen to the mandible. So that's the area of effusion of the mandible right in that area. Okay? So let's get rid of those. Okay? The next thing I want to show you is the condylar process. Okay, now we talked about a condyle. A condyle is a rounded end of a bone, so that's this area, this area. That's a condyle. Now the condyle isn't really round; it's round here, but it's not a ball. It's more like an oval. Okay, I'll show you that in a second. This is sort of actually sort of sort of interesting. And right in front or anterior to that is that mandibular notch, which is this area right there. That's the mandibular notch. Okay, which is just posterior to something that's in front of that, which is called the coronoid process. Why do they have too many coronoids? I don't know. You know here's another coronoid. We had coracoid, we had coronoid, uh, you know, a coronoid tubercle, we had the uh, uh, coronoid uh, uh, process in the elbow, in the ulna, you know. Well, I mean, geez, come on, maybe that, that's the name, it's coronoid in shape, okay. But anyway, that's that. And remember to talk the temporalis muscle, the temporalis muscle attaches to right that, right that, that area right there. The temporalis muscle that fill the temporal fossa that goes underneath that zygomatic arch it attaches right there. It attaches right there, and that's what we see with the condylar process, the mandibular notch, and the uh, uh, coronoid process. Now, before I get on to the next thing that's on this on this sheet, what I want you to do is I want you to take. I can't do it because I have my headphones on. Okay, but well, I can a little bit. I'll have to move my headphones a little bit. But if you take your hands, stick it in front of your ear. Okay, keep your mouth closed. Now open your mouth. Close it. Open it. Close it. Open it. Close it. What happens is instead of that condylar process just rotating inside a socket, it actually comes forward. You feel it come forward? It actually comes forward and out. And that has to do with the shape, with the fact that the that the shape of this is a little bit unusual. It's not it's not round, but a little bit more oblong shaped. Okay? So the the the, the, the you'll actually feel the mandible come forward out of the little socket that it sits in. Feel it? I could feel mine. Okay. And and um, it's called the temporo 
Can we do this? Temporal mandibular joint, or affectionately known as TMJ. So if you have TMJ syndrome, you know what that's all about. What do they do? Tell you to eat, eat soft things. Don't eat anything that's really, don't eat anything that's really chewy. Okay. But that's that's the, the kind of process. What we're going to find is when we look at the temporal bone, there's going to be a little socket in the temporal bone. There's a little bit of a socket in the temporal bone that fits that condylar process. But again, that condylar process actually comes out. I've actually had some. Um, I had a. I was work, like I like I mentioned before. I worked a hockey and I had a player that got hit and I was yeah. <laughs> What's going on? And basically, his temporal mandibular joint sort of popped out. You just have to pull it and pop it back in. But then he had all kinds of temporal mandibular joint. Luckily, we had a dentist on the team who could help out with that afterwards and stuff like that. Then we have our alveolar process. Now, alveolar process is again that is again like we talked about before that porous type bone where the where the roots of the teeth will will sink into. Okay. We have our mental foramen. You see the mental foramen right there. Foramen is a hole. There's mental foramen, mental foramen. And again, that's for nerve to come out and, and blood vessel. So it's inferior to the premolars. So the premolars would be right there. Okay. Uh, mandibular foramen. And, and basically, you, you, you're really not going to see this because it's going to be on the on the inside. So you, yeah, you can see. Oh, you can see it here. You can see it on the other side. Yeah, it's on the inside. Uh, when they when they sometimes um, give you a little bit of a lidocaine you know, or local anesthetic for dental work. What they do is to look where some of these larger nerves are on the inside of the jaw and on the outside and just put put a little bit of local anesthetic and it numbs the whole area where that nerve is going to go to, okay? So that's called the mandibular foramen, which would be this area right in there, okay? And then the mandibular teeth, obviously those are those, okay? So that pretty much explains everything that's on, on this particular slide. If I look at this here we go, here's that, here's the, you know, this is the mental region right here, the alveolar um, uh, um, a process, um, uh, mandibular teeth. Here's the mandibular symphysis right there. Here's the uh, mental foramen, mental foramen. Here's the condyle. Here's the mandibular notch. Here's the coronoid process right there. Here's the body, okay, um, angle. Okay, ramus would be the would be the bar in there. Okay, so basically that's the mandible. Piece of cake, easy. Not a bad, not a not a real hard bone to figure out or to understand. And this is just looking at the mandible right here. This is the mental region again. The chin. Here's the body. Here's the angle we can see. Okay, next we see here's the coronoid process. See a little bump right there. And that's where the that's where the, if you look right here, here's the zygomatic process going to be right here and the. And the temporalis muscle is going to go underneath that and attach to that area right there to help to close the jaw. Okay, here's the alveolar process of the mandible with all that airy type of uh, airy type of bone, that porous type bone. Here's another one. Okay, here's the angle body. Can't see too much. Okay. Here's that. Here's the yeah, coronary process there. You can see it right there. You actually see a little bit of what looks like alveolar. If you look really close in this area of the bone, you can actually see how it looks sort of porous. But that would be the mandible. Here's another mandible. There's the symphysis right there. Here's the ramus. Here's the body. Okay. Uh, I can't read. Yeah, it's hard to see the, the coronoid process. It says it there, but you'd have to know that because why? Superimposition. Let's just mention the, and tie this up with the lateral cranium. Okay, and we've talked a little bit about this before. And again, this is the lateral cranium, what we're going to talk about right here, which is actually a combination of about four different bones. Okay, um, uh, again, we talked about this, be this before. This bone right here is called the parietal bone. That's the parietal bone. Here's the frontal bone. Here's the sphenoid bone. And here's the temporal bone. And this is that area where it comes together. And that's that area called the terion right there. So the terion. That's it right there. It's a portion of the temporal fossa. It's sort of like the mid portion. Here's the zygomatic arch. It's like right straight down the mid portion of the zygomatic arch. It's where the frontal bone, the parietal bone, what's called the greater wing of the sphenoid. Like I mentioned, the sphenoid has, has on each side a greater wing and lesser wing. The greater wing is called the greater wing because it's, of course, it's bigger. Lesser wing is smaller. Okay, And it's where, the, and it's where that as well as the temporal bones unite. Again, uh, it's sort of an S, uh, the, uh, that, uh, that uh, H-shaped area of sutures that come together at that area called the, called the terion. So this is the and if you actually look at the temporal fossa, this is called the temporal fossa. This whole area up in here is called the temporal fossa. It's all, it's hollowed out. There's actually a ridge on the parietal bone. You guys see how there's like a ridge, and that's an area where the where the borders of the of the temporal bone would fit. 
sits right on that ridge. A lot of times when we have a bone that's attached somewhere, there'll be a ridge, and that ridge again, like we talked about, you know, uh, uh, or a line, you know. We talked about gluteal lines in the ilium. We talked about the soleal line in the tibia. We talked about the linea aspera in the femur. And these are just areas, they're, they're lines for demarcation of where muscles will attach. Okay, so that's the temporal fossa. Now, the parietal bone is not really much to speak about. It's just a bone. You know, there's two of them, one on the right, one on the left, and that's about it. There's not many landmarks. So if, you, if there's a bone you can really take about 30 seconds to become an expert in, guess what? Take the parietal bone, okay? And again, here's what we see. Here, again, is that terion right there. So here's my temporal bone coming this way. Here's the sphenoid bone coming up in here. That's a sphenoid right here, you know? Here's the frontal bone right here. So here's frontal parietal, temporal, sphenoid, it comes together at that terion right there, okay? Let me get rid of those. You can actually see the suture lines. And you can see the direct suture line right there. That's the crosshatch. There's the one there. And if that line meets this line, and this line meets this line, and they come across, there's my H. There's the terion. That's that area right there. Okay, piece of cake, easy, not a problem. This is just looking at a lateral skull, okay? Um, not much to see here, okay? And you can actually see what's called the coronal suture. We'll talk about the suture. I should have mentioned, when we talk about the rest of the cranium in the next video, uh, again, this is called the coronal suture. It goes from side to side. There's a longitudinal suture that goes from front to the front to the back. But here's this is called the coronal suture. Look here, a crown like this. Okay. One thing I want to do point out in here, okay, is this area right in here. Okay. If you look right down here, this says this actually says pituitary fossa. Okay. And, and also down here it says cella tersica. Right down in here is this little pocket. There's like like a U-shaped area. Okay, and that's called the uh, pituitary fossa or the hypophyseal fossa. Hypophyseal fossa. Okay, hypophysis means pituitary is another name for the pituitary. Okay, and basically um, it's it's where the pituitary gland sits. It's like a straight back. If I took an ice pick and stuck it between my eyes and pounded it, would go right back into that area. Here's the orbits right here. It would go right straight back into that if I if I pound an ice pick through my skull, which I will not do for a demonstration, okay? But that's called the cella tersica or the pituitary fossa. We'll talk more about the cella tersica. Cella tersica means, cella tersica means Turkish saddle. It has high wings on both sides, and the pituitary sits down in a little depression or fossa between that. A couple other things I'll point out here that we'll talk about later. Cribriform plate. This area right here is the area where those olfactory nerves will come from that first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, down through the skull to get into the roof of the nose, okay? And that's called the cribriform plate, okay? The cribriform plate. It's funny because I see it spelled two ways. Cribriform in many places, and other people say cribriform, and they have an I between, or an R between the B and the I. Both are appropriate, okay? Both are worth. One other thing I want to show you here, and I'll, and, and, uh, and I'll, and I'll go from there, okay, is the front, uh, if you look at the frontal bone, okay? Look at the frontal bone right here. Here's the frontal sinus. See how it's there? See, that's the frontal sinus. And that's showing you that it's open. When we looked at it from that, from, on, a, on a plane, on a, on a frontal plane view, from like front to back, you know, looked on a frontal plane. This, what view is this? This is a sagittal plane, the sagittal plane view, okay, or mid-sagittal. And what happens is now I'm seeing that airspace in that frontal sinus because it's black, it's dark, okay? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's the opening for the ear right here, which is going to be the external acoustic meatus. We'll talk about that when we get to the cranial base. And again, this is just a little review. I put this at the very end so you could look at the facial bones and stuff like that, and you could figure all these out. I think I would definitely know the frontal bone, okay? Frontal squamo, which is basically the regular portion of the bone. Uh, also, another word above, the, this is this is the nasion right here, but sometimes at the area around there where at the, that little ridge at the top is called the glabella, the glabella. That's all what it's called that, okay? Uh, here's the supraorbital notch. Superorbital margin, nasal bones, okay. Uh, superior orbital fissure, you can see right in there. Inferior orbital fissure, you can see just the bottom of it. You can see the bottom of it. You can see the vomer inside there, so that's a good one. 
obviously the mandible, mandible uh, mental foramen, mandibular symphysis down the middle right here. You know the maxilla. You can see the inferior nasal concha. Okay. We didn't talk about the mastoid, but if you take your fingers and put it right behind your ears, we mentioned it very, very briefly in passing, that little bump behind your ear, just behind the lower portion of your earlobe, that's called the mastoid process, and that's that thing right there. Here's the infraorbital foramen, the zygomatic bone, we know that. We, we, we couldn't really see much of the ethmoid. The ethmoid's on the inside, has a sinus inside there, same thing with the lacrimal bone. The optic canal, you can actually see it tick, you know, sort of like just sort of like peeking around the corner, like right there and right there. That's for that optic nerve that we see. So you should probably be able to identify that. Okay. Uh, here's a temporal bone on the side. Uh, you can see that the, the sphenoid sits in here. The sphenoid sits, sphenoid's here, sphenoid's inside in there, inside the inside the orbit. We talked about that. The parietal bone we've talked about. And we just mentioned very briefly the coronal suture, which goes from side to side. Okay, so basically, I think you should probably be able to identify all of those. I think that those are pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Most of them are pretty straightforward. Okay, and hopefully that will make a lot of sense to you. And as always, if you have any questions, just uh, uh, let me know. Uh, give me, uh, send me an email or whatever the case may be, and we'll get that all figured out, and uh, we'll go from there. So for now, uh, again, be safe, be healthy, and we'll see you next time. Next time we'll be talking a little bit more about the superior cranium, superior cranium.